Welcome back to the Demystify Side podcast. I'm your host, Anastasia. I'm Michael Shiloh. And today we have with us Dr. Clarice Ayello, who is at UCLA and is working on quantum biology. And this conversation is so, so good. It is interesting because what it does is it takes the strangeness of physics and puts it directly into biological systems because Dr. Aiello believes that our understanding of biology is limited by our traditional molecular receptor kind of interactions where what we look at is we just look at molecules and they're bumping around inside of cells and they do stuff. But her background as a quantum engineer has let her look at biology from the perspective of quantum physics where she's like, look, we know that magnetic fields affect reactions inside of test tubes. And if they can affect reactions inside of test tubes, then it's reasonable to consider that they're probably also affecting reactions inside of biology. And she's fighting an uphill battle because most physicists are not interested in biology. Most biologists are not interested in physics, but she is at the forefront of 40 years of data and experimental evidence that includes no less than Michael Levin's research about the ability to change the regenerative abilities of planarian flatworms with an applied electromagnetic field. And she's taking all of these ideas and she's bringing them together into a new field that says, hey, we can take external magnetic fields and we can change your biology. And that means everything from wound healing to the internal oxidative state of cells, which has a lot to do with aging and inflammation and general health. It has to do with cancer. It has to do with what else? While a lot of people recognize that external magnetic fields and photonics do have an influence on different biological phenomena. The power and the breadth of the frequency range that's being used almost certainly impacts a lot of different systems. And so the goal of quantum biology is to refine the information landscape so that the scientists can actually understand which systems they're interacting with through which energies of electromagnetic stimulation. And so there's essentially this huge landscape of possibilities by which humans could create some sort of technology in the future that's very simple. It doesn't require super powerful computers or, or super powerful electromagnetic fields, but does require the knowledge of how to apply them. And that's what this all comes down to. We spend two hours sifting through all of the clues and the mechanistic basement on which they function and it just it makes me want to just run down the street telling people about it because this is so such cool work and I'm so grateful Dr. Aiello actually found us she just reached out to us and she was like hey do you, do you guys want to talk about quantum biology and it was a wild ride she is kind she is patient she is curious the absolute epitome of what it means to be just a fantastic scientist and i'm so so excited to share it with you so tell us what you think in the comments or come over to discord hang out and see who we can talk to more about this kind of thing and how we can raise awareness for this kind of research i hope someday we can actually find ourselves in the position to be able to fund research like this because one of the things we talk about is how difficult it is to fund these disruptive ideas within the traditional institutional framework and so consider helping us out over at patreon once we're able to actually keep the lights on here we're going to start putting that money into a nonprofit to be able to fund research like this and research that doesn't fit into those traditional structures because it definitely needs to be done, but there's not really a home for it inside the academy right now. So enjoy the conversation, and we'll see you next time. The scientific revolution starts now. The Let us see the dark. My name is Clarissa Yellow. I'm born and raised in Brazil, so that's where this accent that you're hearing comes from. Uh, I am um, an assistant professor in electrical engineering at UCLA. Uh, trained as uh, what I call, I'm trained as a quantum engineer, 
This means that I build instruments to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment that they're better described by the laws of quantum mechanics as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything big around us. So uh, my training is uh, in the field of quantum sensing, which means the following. It can be proven that if you use a quantum object, such as an electron, as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances your measurement. So uh, all my work until five years ago was geared towards technological applications of quantum stuff, technological applications of quantum sensors. At some point, almost by chance, uh, I realized that there were some uh, processes occurring in nature uh, at room temperature within proteins that were very similar to quantum sensing and um, suggesting, I mean, I'm, I'm not the first person to have thought about it, but suggesting that nature might be using the funky laws of quantum mechanics to function and to function optimally. So uh, the field that studies and tries to control, to harness such endogenous quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in nature, this field, this emerging field, interdisciplinary field, is called quantum biology. Now, quantum biology is not using quantum tools to learn about classical biology. It's not about, you might have heard about this, all this hype about quantum computers that are going to speed up a lot of stuff. It's not using quantum computers for drug discovery or for treatment of like big healthcare data. And it's of course, and it's important for me to mention this, it's not about uh, any mystic new age notion on like, quantum processes that might be behind consciousness and stuff. Sometimes the, the broad public is unfortunately introduced to quantum biology via claims that remain unverifiable about quantumness being involved in many weird things. So that's not about that at all. It's a serious field of research uh, that is starting to be more and more legitimized. Yeah, it seems like you're you're saying that essentially the wave nature of matter really matters at the molecular level. If I could just simplify it in some sense. Yes, it's not only the wave nature of matter. There are many other different uh, quantum phenomena that matter, but that's absolutely uh, what it means. The 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 weird stuff that people see uh, in quantum mechanics, say in materials at very nanoscopic length scales might be at play in biology and might importantly have macroscopic consequences on the workings of biology. And beyond the, the, the wave nature of, of matter, what kinds of quantum effects are we talking about? So, for example, there is a quantum mechanical effect called tunneling. Okay. So uh, tunneling uh, means that a quantum particle can go through barriers that it cannot, like, go through, if you will, energetic barriers that it doesn't have enough energy to go around. It's as if, like, sometimes if you have like a, a classical ball, right, and there is a there is a wall, uh, if you don't give enough energy for this ball to go to the other side, the ball will never appear on the other side. A quantum object, however, if you throw this quantum object through this wall, even without giving enough energy for it to go over the wall, there's a probability that this quantum object, such as an electron, can go through, appear on the other side of this wall, unscathed and without destroying the barrier. This is called tunneling. And uh, tunneling is thought to underlie, for example, how our enzymes work, mm. like the, 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 the molecules that make chemical reactions uh, go quicker. So there's evidence that uh, enzymatic functioning that is crucial for life, for chemistry, uh, it happens because of this quantum effect. And is that is that an updating of the old kind of stereochemistry stabilization in reaction sites sort of perspective? That because I because have it used no 
Okay, yeah. well, because I mean, like, I, I I did a lot of protein crystallography, and so I look. I spent a lot of time oh. looking at okay. uh, the active sites of enzymes. Yep. And the the explanation that was always given for how enzymes bring down uh, reaction energies was by virtue of just taking something that in solution would take a really long time to bump into each other in the right orientation and basically just fix it at exactly the right position in order for the reaction to be able to happen. Oh, and so is that is that understand how does that relate to the quantum tunneling thing? Um, it, so, so again, disclaimer, that's not my main field of work, uh, but in the way that I, I like the way that you put it, that it might be a, a newer take or, or an incredible an improvement uh, in the understanding of how enzymes work. Uh, if you're curious about uh, about this, the world expert on this is a chemist from the UC Berkeley called Judith Klinman that has been working for more than 20 years to show that uh, both electron and proton tunneling somehow is involved in this in this barrier, energetic barrier crossing. So yes, uh, in the way that I understand, uh, the, uh, the, the, in order for the enzymes to, to, to make the reactions cross the barrier, there's some sort of tunneling involved. I am not sure exactly at what point of the catalyst, uh, interaction. So that, that I cannot speak to, but quantum tunneling is definitely there. And without this, uh, we wouldn't have, uh, enzymatic activity. Hmm. Okay, so we have uh, the wave nature of matter. We have quantum tunneling. What are some other biological effects? That well, you're like, what are the ones that you're most closely familiar with? And the ones you're most excited about, yeah. Yes. So I'm excited about something that um, could be related to this, uh, to this uh, wave nature of matter uh, that has to do with a superposition. So um, waves... Uh, like classical light waves, water waves have this very interesting property in that they interfere, right? So that places where the wave is very strong, if you meet another wave uh, that is very weak at some point, there is interference like in, in the intensity of the waves. For quantum objects, that is um, also... The case, for example, uh, one of the ways that the wave behavior manifests, for example, in an electron, is that it can be in two places at the same time. There can be a, a superposition that implies some sort of like interference of where the electron is. The electron can be here and here at the same time. An electron can have one energy and another energy at the same time. What I care about is uh, a property of an electron, I'll explain in a second, that is called spin. And all the things that I uh, study have to do with superposition of spins, electrons having two different spin states at the same time. And if you allow me, I can tell you a little bit about spin. So, yeah, we, we, we love spin. We think about it a lot, actually. Oh, so yeah, so yeah. tell me more. Tell me more. Well, maybe we can get to it, but mostly we we work on trying to visualize what what this could look like in terms of the material surface of the atom or something like that. But I, I want to hear about about how you are using this. Uh, awesome. What, this uh, what is it? Um, spook. This it's basically this spooky action at a distance uh, entanglement idea. It sounds like yeah, su yeah, is superposition directly related to entanglement. So I think entanglement is one level up. Right, so maybe we can talk about different levels of quantumness. So fundamentally, everything is quantum because everything is made out of atoms. Everything is is linked by uh, chemical bonds. This is like the trivial quantum level. The first level above this is the fact that uh, a single quantum object can exhibit superposition. That is, that a single quantum object can, in other words, interfere or display quantum-like properties such as being at the same in, in two different places at the same time, having two energies at the same time, having two spin states at the same time. So superposition is um, the property of one quantum object. For instance, even with only superposition, you can already have a quantum uh, 
a quantum advantage. Technological quantum sensors already outperform classical sensors if they, I mean, because of superposition. So there are quantum sensors that work only and work and work super well only because they can uh, can exhibit superposition for a finite time. That's then the second level of quantumness. The third level of quantumness is a little bit more complicated, and uh, it's what quantum computers need, for example, to function, and that is entanglement. If you will, entanglement is a um, unusual interaction, uh, an unusual quantum interaction between two or more quantum objects. So in, in to some extent, if you don't have, so if one single quantum object cannot sustain a superposition, there is no way that that quantum object and another one can sustain entanglement. The important part being here that everything that starts quantum dies classical. Uh, when a lot of single quantum systems start interacting with themselves and interacting with their environment, they start growing in size, those um, interactions, uncontrollable interactions between those quantum systems make them be better described by classical physics. So, uh, in a sense, um, all quantum objects, after a while, they, they will be better described by classical mechanics, again, to some, to some extent. Um, and uh, what people do in, in the lab, experimentalists, since the 1950s, is to find ways to extend the time during which those objects are quantum. The idea being that the longer you can keep those quantum objects in a bona fide quantum state, the longer you can harness their quantum properties for a lot of important stuff, from uh, magnetic resonance imaging to, say, future quantum computers to, I would say, uh, the therapeutic applications of quantum biology that I'll describe in a minute. I, I really love this idea that things enter into a quantum state and that you have to maintain them in that quantum state in order to do something with them. And when you say that, it makes me think that, so for something like the electron, is there, I've, I've always considered it as being always described by, as a quantum object. But it sounds like what you're saying is that it's possible to like put it into a, a state that's quantum that it's not always in. Um, let me. It, 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 you are right that spin um, does not have a classical analog. Spin is a merely quantum mechanical property. This said, um, when spins are left alone, they are very similar to what you would expect from a tiny magnet, okay? They are just a very, very, very tiny magnet. This is, is what I mean by a classical description of what an electron spin is like. A, it, 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 and, and maybe if you allow me, I'll explain what spin, do, do, do we assume that, you're, that your audience know like what uh, spins are or? Yeah, I mean, I, it wouldn't I, hurt for, to have a refresher, but I think that a lot of people probably nerd out on this stuff a bit. We've had a number of people on the show talking about spin, particularly in the production of magnetism and trying to imagine how the lattice configuration of different metals provides for ferromagnetism and, you know, different cool. instances okay. of magnetism. So we, we've played with it a bunch, but yeah, please go ahead and, and present uh, your picture. I just want to. I want to add to this, which is that in physics, oftentimes words like words tend to mean different things depending on the presentation in which somebody's using them. Like, yes. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, there was a big quanta article about what is a particle, and it listed oh. like s seven different definitions of particle that were mutually ex exclusive in use in different labs across the world. Oh, and oh my god! Cool. But that's just the, that's just the thing, right? So yeah. defining it for the presentation at hand always seems like it makes a lot of sense. Awesome, and you made me curious. I'll go after that. <laughs> that quanta article. Exactly. So, so he, here's what I'm calling spin. So, um, again, spin is a fundamentally quantum property of matter. Everything has spins, right? For example, electrons, atomic nuclei, and in the same way that. Uh, Electrons have mass and have charge, they also have spin. 
for example, we can understand the mass of an electron uh, as determining how the electron interacts with the gravitational field. We can understand the charge of the electron as determining how an electron interacts with an electric field. Spin determines how an electron interacts with magnetic fields. In the same way that uh, a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion interact differently with the magnet uh, with an electric field different spins interact with differently with a with an, a magnetic field uh charges again it's it's an arbitrary mm, distinction charges are called positive and negative right we could have called them nice charges and not nice charges or something <laughs> electrons are usually described by a narrow so um, if the arrow points up, people say that the spin is up. If the arrow points down, people say that the electron spin has its uh, spin property down. And this only means different ways of interacting with a magnetic field. So this is how uh, I am defining spins. So uh, electrons and electron spins left to their own device will prefer to point either up or now, uh, this would be akin to what you would have if you had like a very, very tiny uh, electromagnet, a very, very tiny like magnet that you just changed its orientation in a magnetic field. This is my classical description of what a spin is. Sometimes you can go to the lab and actually manipulate the state, the, the the spin state of this electron, so that it is in a superposition of spin up and spin down, uh, which means that it is in this funky quantum superposition state, which cannot be described by any combination of classical tiny magnets. If you're curious, um, Quantum degrees of freedom in matter, like uh, in an electron, can be manipulated by light, by electromagnetic fields. May, uh, it may be visible light, microwaves, uh, x-rays, right? So um, light can manipulate uh, quantum, the quantumness of matter and put it like in a superposition of, say, spin up and spin down. So what happens is that with time, again, if the spin in a superposition is left to its own device, at some point it will decay back to either only up or either only down again, being eventually well described by a tiny magnet again. But by that point, the electron has ceased to be able to, uh, to be used for like some quantum enhanced application, right? So, uh, so we were back. To I, I love I love this. I like this is this is so clarifying for me. You can't you can't believe. Go ahead. I was just gonna ask: Is this a is this a Schrodinger's cat situation where the cat seems to be alive and dead at the same time? Yes. But is it? But are we really just unsure of which state it's in, or are you asserting that it, there's some no. reason to believe it's actually in both states simultaneously? It is in both states. It's it's. I know it's difficult for us to wrap our heads. Around, well, oh, so hold on, hold on, hold on. What I was yes, going to say yes, yes. is, can you tell the difference between it being in both states at the same time and it switching between states so quickly that it appears to be in both? Uh, or, uh, or, or, or the third option would be that it's there's a number of that you're looking at the statistical average of a number of different particles at once. Oh, yes, yes. There are experimental ways for you to prove that the only thing that can explain the, the outcomes of those experiments is that if you have a bona fide spin superposition. That's, that's a very nice question. So um, experiments that have been performed uh, since the, the 1950s or so, all those like foundational experiments have been performed uh, within nuclear magnetic resonance, right? Which were the first, which uh, take care of like, which mess up or control uh, spins of uh, atomic nuclei. So there were foundational experiments that that are like 80 years old or something that no well less well less than that but there's can you break down one of those for us can, yeah because we were we literally like the other day we were uh, we did a little video on beta decay 
And so I went into the literature and I was looking at the experimental apparatus that they used to do the first beta decay experiments in like 67 or something. But even there, there's so many assumptions that go into the construction of the apparatus that they have when writing the paper that I can, I can kind of pull it apart and understand it. But having a physicist in the room who can explain it is definitely a... Yeah, like what? What were that? Can you just give us an? Ex- can you give us some example of? Yes. Of that, uh, yeah. Yes. So uh, let me talk about a fundamental experiment done by um, what's his first name? I think it's Isaac. Uh, so let's name Rabbi. Okay. So uh, there were some some calculations that that were hypothesized would work. Uh, so. F- let me rephrase this. Uh, people were interested in exactly trying to understand whether, like, are the spins really in a superposition? Are they just going back and forth very, very fast? Or is it just a statistical mixture and we don't know <laughs> how, to, how to measure those things? So, um, Rabi made an experiment uh, that is now uh, very famous and that proves unambiguously that um, the spins that you can mess up with electromagnetic fields are actually uh, are actually in this funky uh, superposition state. Okay? It turns out that uh, calculations, like quantum mechanical calculations, indicate that uh, you have two different uh, electron spin states, okay, which spin up, and spin down, and there is a certain energy difference between those two states. Say there is one gigahertz of energy difference from you being in electron spin down and from being in electron spin up. Um, it turns out that, uh, and th- that's what the calculations indicated, that if you um, start with, say, a spin down and you apply a microwave at exactly this frequency of one gigahertz, that you can actually put the spin into, start with spin down, put the the spin in a superposition of up and down, and then put it back to, to put put it to up, and then put it back into a superposition, and then put it down in a way that is reversible and periodic in time. So what Ravi actually proved in the lab, here's what he did. He uh, actually uh, pushed his electrons uh, through a device that could measure if the spin was up or if the spin was down. Okay. Uh, This experiment was repeated for each point in time with like a gazillion of electrons. Actually, that's not how it was done. Like, I don't think it was done with electrons, but the idea is the same. So you take a gazillion electrons, put it in electron spin down, turn an electromagnetic field of one gigahertz on for a different period of time, okay? And then like for for a given time, like one microsecond, and then push all your gazillion electrons through a machine that can tell you if you're down or up. So at time equals zero, at the beginning of your experiment, you start with all, uh, with all um, spins being down. And then he took like proportion of spins uh, down as a function of the time during which the radiation was turned on. And what he saw, like in each point in, in time is the uh, it, it, like is taken for uh, is like the proportion is is taken for a gazillion electrons, and you're measuring the proportion or like the percentage of spin down. So you start with a hundred percent spin down. With the next uh, point in time, you have a little bit less, a little bit less. That means that you're starting to see both spin up and spin down. At some point, you only see spin up. And then it goes up again, like you start seeing a little bit of the electrons in spin up and and most of spin down and so forth. So you have a sinusoidal-like curve 
that sort of that, that agrees with this quantum theory that actually it's not a statistical mixture. It's just that at every point in time, you have like a different combination of spin up and spin down. Something that your um, audience might not know is that every time you measure a quantum system, you destroy any type of superposition. In that when you look at your system, you only see a classical state. This means that for a spin that is in a superposition of up and down, uh, if you, when you measure your spins through Ruby's machine, you will only find spin up or spin down, but at different proportions, if you will. So, uh, with different instances in time, you see a different proportions of spin up and spin down that give you information of what the quantum state was like before you made the measurement. And this type of measurement gave results that were only consistent with this quantum description that the electron is indeed at both spin states at the same time. Oof, that was long, sorry. I mean, I looking listening to that, it basically sounds like you you have uh, a, a it's like it's an electron beam that they're working with or like a positron beam or like a, a, a beam of something. A beam of something. I don't know sure. exactly what Rabi did. It was probably not electrons. It was probably some 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 type of atoms or a beam of atoms. But but that's exactly what it is. Okay, so you have a beam. Uh, you have a. a, a <laughs> I was going to call them particles, but knowing how confusing that is, you have a beam of atoms. Let's say. Yes. And so you apply this microwave radiation to them, and in measuring them, what you're doing is you are breaking the superposition state to give you either from 100% spin up to some ratio of spin up, spin down to yes. some ratio of 100% spin down. And then it basically yes. oscillates back and forth. Okay. Yes. And the fact that it's reversible, it's extremely important. Okay. The fact that, that it's reversible means that it's also like a quantum process. That, uh, that 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 can go back in and forth. It's not that it's here. I mean, it, 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 there is um, the jargon for that is a coherent evolution. It doesn't really matter, but it's super important that this just by turning the radiation on, you can induce those superpositions in a way that is absolutely reversible. So when I think about the way that light interacts with atoms, I think of it interacting in a vibrational way. Like, so we uh, we had, uh, do you know Carver Mead? He's a Caltech uh, no. physicist, oh semiconductors. He, yeah. he wrote a really interesting book called uh, Collective Electrodynamics, and he calls it his little green book because it's basically a manifesto on... Uh, what he believes after a life spent in the semiconductor industry to be a a better interpretation of quantum mechanics. And obviously, like, you can take it with a grain of salt, but his point is he's like, look, in a single atom universe, you couldn't have light. Light has to be a communication between atoms. And so oh, we cool. treat it... Okay. We treat it as, you know, the photon, which is this thing that, like, pings off into space and then right. hits another atom. Right. But if we were to rationalize it, his perspective is that... And he pulls on... Uh, do you know Gian Lewis? He was a chemist in, like, the 20s. He was the one who... You know Lewis Lewis Oh, the Lewis! Yes! Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Gian Lewis, back in the day, was like, hey, I'm pretty sure that light is a communication between atoms. And then the quantum stuff took off and people weren't really paying attention to it. And then Mead started to read Lewis's old work and he was like, hey, I think he's onto something. Mm -hmm. And so he proposes light to be a, a mode of vibrational exchange between between atoms. And so if you have one atom that's vibrating at one state and you have another atom that's vibrating at a state that's in tune, if you change the vibration of the other atom, you're going to transmit that that mismatch in vibration between them and that's what's going to be the photon. Well, are, oh. Well, that's that's interesting. But are you talking about like Raman transitions, like the frequency of vibrations of bonds that yeah, can emit and absorb I think I mean, we're just talking about energy level, like the quantum number. Yeah, like N. let's say if we take if we take two hydrogen atoms, 
Okay. Let's say right. So let's because I think that yeah. with ramen, like you have you have um, molecular vibrations right. where it's the bond vibrations. But like let's let's dispense from let's dispense bonds. Okay. From talking it. about electron energy, I think ultimately, and, yeah, and just, are energy levels like in the Bohr model of the atom, they're the they're the different energy leaps, the quantum leaps, I guess. Okay, and like people talk about quantum breathing of atoms, right? Which is the fact that. That like the the atom is not just sitting in space as this still object; it's it's pulsing. Yeah, well, and quantum as jump, I think they call them quantum jumps. I think. Yeah, quantum jumps, quantum breathing. We use breathing, but <laughs> but so okay, so you are taking this microwave radiation, which is being produced by atoms. You're exciting atoms using electricity or something in order to produce this photon that is impinging upon the electrons or the atoms that are inside of Rabi's detector. And so why the, the quantum interpretation has always seemed to be more magical than it has to be for me because I'm like, I agree. <laughs> right? And I'm like, okay, so hold on a second. Well, if it's just, if it's vibrating because it's taking the radiation, it's absorbing it and it's vibrating it. And when you measure it, you're going to be detecting whichever, whichever vibrational state it's in. And so you're going to detect a straightforward outcome of up or down as an interruption of the vibrational mode that it's that it's in, which is the superposition. Like it's a complex vibration that it that, gets. That's an interesting interpretation. I'm not sure I, I totally get it. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Uh, what do you mean by superposition here, Nastia? Well, superposition is that we're basically saying that there's something called spin up and there's something that's spin down. Yep. And so if you imagine that spin, let's let's say that it is like a bar magnet. And so everything that's spin up has its bar magnet pointing north and everything yep. that's spin down, north is pointing down, right? So spin up, north is pointing up, yep. spin down, north is pointing down. Superposition would be that it's going really quickly back and forth between spin mm. up and spin down. N no, no, that, that's not what it is. Okay. Uh, superposition is not a, a a quick switching between between states it's a uh, it's a linear combination it's a mixture it's like it's both at the same time but it, how can it, we how can we tell if our detectors are not able to like if it's like think about um like i think about a propeller okay right so when the propeller is stopped you're like Okay, so there's an orientation for the propeller, which is, let's say you had the two lobes of the propeller painted, one's red, one's green. And you're like, obviously, like, it is, it obeys classical mechanics, and right. I can, I can right. rotate it. And, but then when you turn the propeller on, you no longer have the ability to tell, unless you have a camera that has a sufficiently high shutter speed, where you can take photographs of it and see Fair. it pulsing. Fair. Let me let me tell you another uh, experiment that might alleviate your okay. your concerns. If um, and we come back to the matter uh, to the wave character of of things. If the spin is really in a superposition and not like in some very fast, funky up and down state, it means that it can interfere, okay, uh, with itself in in some way, and. Um, there are also experimental ways of demonstrating that um, th this type, if you if you if you turn on this perturbation, this light for a different duration, that uh, you can also like make this this like make this interference appear. So maybe that's clearer in a second experiment. Um, of a guy called Ramsey. So um, here's what uh, Ramsey did, okay? and, and I think that the, the interference character of this is is important. So uh, in his experiment, Ramsey started with a spin down, applied a pulse that was long enough to put the spin in a superposition, okay, and then applied a magnetic field that interacts differently with spin up and spin down for a different duration. So uh, depending, so you start with the spin down, you put it in, in, a, in a spin superposition, 
and then you turn a magnetic field on for one microsecond, then for two microseconds, you start again and do the same for two microseconds, then you start again with new atoms, put them in a superposition, start for, for, for like three microseconds, and uh, you can sort of uh, see that the interaction of this electron uh, of this electron beam or each individual electron with this magnetic field because it is different as a function of time because their spin down component and its spin up component interferes. And that is only possible if the electron has the two components at the same time. Hmm. I'm so I'm not sure I can be more clear than than that, but there are ways of. Um, I want to. Uh, do you know what the the ty- the the paper is called? Uh, it's like Ramsey interferometry. Interferometry. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm just not clear on how we're separating out uh, the statistical smearing of events versus individual ones. But I, I assume I I hear that it's somehow temporarily restricted and there's some assessment based on that so um um a, a statistical mixture of spin up and spin down would like it, it, it's just like a classical pot of electrons that has like 40 percent have spin up 60 percent have spin down a single electron okay maybe maybe a, another a, 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 another layer of this thing um the key point here is that a single electron spin can interact with itself here's an analogy with this a superposition of places I, I i think you might have heard about the 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 two slit experiment right so um for example if you have a uh, a wall with two slits where you can shoot things through and you shoot like cannonballs through through this this wall. The cannonballs will only go through the the places of the slit. So if you have another wall uh, behind, you will see that all the cannonballs accumulate in, uh, in 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 two places only. That is different from what you would happen uh, if you if you shown a light that goes through those two slits when you go to the 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 wall behind, you would see an interference pattern of places where there's more light, fewer light, which is like interference. It turns out that with electrons and other quantum objects, if you put them through a double slit, they also form this interference pattern. Importantly, this is also true if you shoot one electron at a time. Okay. Which is just, ba- I mean, that the assumption that you can shoot one electron at a time is is certainly interesting because the only way you can know that is based on the energy output of the device over some time integral, right? So, so you can you can you can have an electron detector in your behind in your wall behind, and that electron detector uh, will click or will will light a light in the position of the electron. Right? And you do this with thousands of electrons that do not talk to each other. They can be sent once at a time. Right? But in the end, after you read out the lights uh, where, where all the electrons have accumulated, you will see an interference pattern. This is only. But I, I guess, true. like, I guess yes. the, the way that I look at that is that the detector has some threshold limit of energy, right? Where it's going to give a click or not. And so it could be getting all sorts of smaller levels of energy at any given time, but it's only going to click off when it reaches some threshold, essentially. Well, and so you can't really, really detectors. say... I mean, y- yeah. y- you, you can buy the appropriate electron detector to your experiment, that when you shoot the particular electron um, f- with the energy that you shoot, that's not the point. The energy of the electron is not the point. The point is that the electron, the single electron, is going through both slits at the same time. Well, yeah, I guess the question for me comes down to, is it really a single electron? Or are you looking at lots of events happening simultaneously, but they're only... at be simultaneous. 
But the only sh- yeah, the yeah. only way you Go know it's it. a single electron is by its energy, right? So you, you you fire you shoot up you charge up your gun to one electron worth of energy, right? But it's a continuous stream, uh, right? There's no, no, it, it doesn't need to be a continuous stream. You can shoot one electron today, one electron tomorrow, and by the end of the year, if you look at the pattern formed by these 365 electrons that were absolutely independent of each other in time, you still see a interference-like pattern behind the two slits. But the that elect- but that could easily be explained by what you're doing when you turn when you fire that electron is you're exciting electrically the environment, right? Say so, like these these vacuum tubes are full of some sort of atoms, right? They're some rarefied atoms, right? So you're exciting that system electrically and some amount of that energy is making its way through the slits, both of them, to the back where it's interacting with the atoms at the back on the detector. And and the back detector is only going to register one electron like, worth of energy. There's a threshold to that detector. And so when you fire a bunch of them, eventually you sum up to results that, that show you the interference pattern that's happening all the time anyways, something like that. Well, well, yes. I mean, if the electrons were behaving as classical particles, that is, if they were like cannonballs, you would have like two blobs on your behind wall. Right? Sure. You would have a blob behind the first slit and a blob behind the second slit, but this is not what happens. So assuming, and at some point you have to, 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 to trust that the experimental conditions are good enough for what you're trying to measure. Here the idea is like an electron is behaving according to the laws of quantum mechanics because it has a superposition of position. It can go between the through the two slits at the same time giving a uh, a, a interference pattern, right? And that is makes the electron different from uh, a cannonball. And this is the same... I mean, I think that's the problem is like that we're calling... On one hand, we treat the electron like a cannonball because we call it a thing, right? But it's not really a thing. It's a dynamic object. Like it has momentum and it's not a static thing, right? It's a constant... It's an idea. Th- that's that's correct. And the same thing as the photon, right? Is the photon a particle which imparts momentum, like which is what makes solar sails work, or is it a wave, right, that causes interference? Well, either way, there's one thing is certain: it's not a it's not a material body that like a cannonball that crashes through things. It's got it has dynamic qualities to it, so it can't possibly be a material body. Like a table isn't a table is a static concept. You don't have to have some motion inherent in it in order to conceive of it. Well, uh, but uh, 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 an electron has motion wrapped up in it because it has momentum to it. Do you see what I'm saying? So like you're moving yeah, ar- table, you're moving around ideas basically. Like these things that you're firing are ideas. They're not actually material bodies. And so uh, That's where things start to get really confusing. I I agree. And for example, there are electron microscopes, right? That work by shooting electron beams through particles. And and, I mean, in the sense, those are uh, physical bodies, right? That are... I guess I would say they're not really shooting anything. They're really just exciting the atoms in the gas chamber, in the vacuum chamber. They're exciting them with some quantized amount of energy. But they're not. Sh- there's nothing being shot, really. There's still yeah, really. There is. But what? There, there how, is. But how can an idea be? Sh- but an electron's an idea. It's not a physical body. So well, how can you? Sh- like how can you particle. shoot an idea, right? It's like a particle, right? But a I particle mean, is I, an idea too, right? It's a. Ve- it's a. It has a vector <laughs> potential. It's an. It's an idea, right? So like, it gets really confusing when we start moving ideas around and treating them like material yeah. bodies. But, well, I think that to bring this back to a biological system. Which I think that you're right. I like. I think that you're right. That there's, like, there there is a deep confusion about yes. the nature yes. of electrons, and I think that yes. quantum stuff gets really, really uncomfortable and weird because there is a tendency to reify concepts into actors, and yeah, by fair, I think that fair. that's what you're saying. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just that's fair. the reason it seems so spooky is because. Um, in in the same sentence, we can treat these ideas as if they're concrete bodies, but they're not. And so when we start talking about concrete bodies being in two places that are doing two things at once, like it gets insane. But if you realize that you're actually talking about a property or right or 
or an idea, which is this electron, which is a particular motion of the atomic surface or whatever, then it starts to make a little more sense. And so, call anato- sorry, just a question. Would you call an atom- anatomic nuclei a, a particular body or... or- no, I would just no. say it represents some activity of the at- of the fiber of the atom itself. Like some, the nuclei is definitely something that the uh, particular structural elements of the atom, like some architectural aspect of the atom, is undergoing some motion that has a particular momentum to it, and you know it has all of these angular momentum qualities. It has. What about mass? Like, so, so how do you ex- can I ask questions? Because now yeah, I'm- yeah, let's <laughs> do it. <laughs> mass is yeah. I think you nailed mass. Actually, I mean, I think you you nailed mass. That it's an atomic phenomenon that relates to gravity, right? I mean, ad- atoms take atoms. Um, assemblies of atoms display mass because atoms fundamentally are connected to each other and pull on each other. And so mass scales the amount of pull that an atom demonstrates upon a neighboring atom, essentially. But but at the quantum, I mean, and of course it gets really weird because at the quantum level, people just start uh, translating mass into deflection, electrical deflection or magnetic deflection, right? That's why we have the electron volt and stuff. So I'm not sure that mass is really a great word for things that are happening below the atom, basically. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, we can take it back over to biology. I just, I, I don't, I don't mean to like cut the conversation off. I'm just <laughs> trying to like link it because. So look, you've stumbled upon something that we spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about because one of our projects is attempting to create visualizations of the quantum world. Oh, okay, nice. And so we're informed by the work of people like Carver Mead, who basically is like, look, I think that there's a non-spooky interpretation that is possible. And not just okay. not just visualizations, but material interpretations, right? Like full disclosure, my PhD was in oh. material science. Like all of my all of my work was in elastic harmonics. And I cannot look at an atom without thinking about elastic harmonics. Interesting. Like, it is cool. identical mathematics essentially to and treat cool. it like a harmonic oscillator. And, and so- all of my work was in the redox sensing ability of bacteria and it was so non-material because it's like what is charge and it's like stop asking that question yeah and i'm like (laughs) how can i write a dissertation without explaining what charge like this was an existential crisis that i had towards the end of my phd where i was writing my dissertation and he and my my boss wanted me to move electrons around and i'm like (laughs) You have to explain to me what charge is in order for us to have this conversation. And he was just apoplectic with me. He was like, that is not up for debate. It just is. The physicists tell us. And then I would go to the physicists and I'm like, yo, what is charge? And they're just kind of like... Fundamentally. (laughs) It is what it is. It is what it is. So it's like a really, it's a really exciting, like fresh domain is like the material interpretation of quantum mechanics, because everybody essentially understands whether it's the physicists or biology that something is doing something, but that we don't really need to know that to technologically manipulate it. We really just need to parameterize it. And so that's good enough. But we're kind of like, our whole thing is like, well, it might be good enough for technology, but we really, really want to make sense of it at the end of the day. And so we're left, obviously we can't touch things smaller than an atom, but we can imagine what those structures must look like. And so it's um, it's something, it's somewhere orphaned between philosophy and physics somewhere. And I think that it, the foundational principle behind it is that when you get to quantum, people are like, you, it's, it's unimaginable. Like you, you're not supposed to be able to visualize superposition. And I'm like, I don't, I know that I'm supposed to just accept that. I know that I'm supposed to just be like, okay, it's unimaginable. I guess it's just my, my pea brain can't grasp it. But I'm like, surely there's at least a frame that we could put on top of it that would feel graspable. And so I think that that's what I'm getting at where, where, where I'm asking the questions about, okay, so superposition, perhaps us not being able to deconvolve the frames of the movie, because then at least I can have a physical thing that's happening in response to the photon, the vibrational mode, the interruption of vibration, the, the resonance and vibration based off of everything that we've talked about with Shiloh in the past makes sense to me as an interpretation of what is happening. Okay. But I know that it's not the canonical interpretation because, and I want to know what you think about this. I think that there's almost a... 
there is there's almost a value that is based on the incomprehensibility of quantum. A value? I yeah, think like, it's bad for people not to understand, no? Like or, or I would agree, but I think that people who are quantum physicists traditionally cherish that incomprehensibility. Oh, oh, that I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I agree with, with that sense that, that some people li- would like it to remain mystical and no, like, or... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because like when we first started doing all this, like we've done some, we've got some, we're working with an animator now and we're coming up with some really beautiful oh, stuff. Nice. But when we first started making these visualizations of quantum phenomena, like, you know, like spin one half, for instance, or something like trying to imagine what the shell of the atom could be doing to make spin one half. Um, We thought everybody would be like, we'd go show this to fit, like take that out. I don't know, to Reddit or something and like share it with people. And they'd be like, wow, that's really useful. Thanks a lot. But everybody's just like, what are you doing? Like it's, it's, it's magic basically. And how dare you try to make sense of it in some, you know, material sense. And, and, and so we just have really come to to feel like there is this desire to mystify it. Like people want magic in the world. And if you try, and and I'm not trying to take the magic away from them. Like, I think there's plenty of magic in our daily lives, but I don't, I'm not sure that material physics is where the magic is at basically. That's but people a want it. Very nice way of of looking at at all of this, and I totally agree that uh, there are some people who benefit from t- t- trying to 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 again mystify what they work on, and and like saying, well, this is not for you. This is just for people who can understand this and stuff. So I totally agree that 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 more visualization and less magic in explaining quantum would go. A long ways, and and again, that's also related to I think the appeal of quantum biology because some people, most people, get to know about quantum biology with like weird notions, and people start saying, "Well, quantum biology is behind like thoughts and stuff," and it I, I think it comes from a primal need that that. Your, our thoughts come from this special weird place and stuff and, and I totally agree that that which yeah. might be true but it's it probably has nothing to do with quantum uh, quantum <laughs> physics right I mean it is hard to imagine like where where a thought comes from exactly it's like yeah. it's you know obviously I'm getting thoughts from my environment from my friends from my ancestors from my dreams of the future like it's this yeah. very very magical process for sure but it has probably very little to do with material physics and quantum physics or whatever you want to call it yeah or or if it has at this point in time it's unverifiable it's like at this point in time it's like string theory right it may be true or it may not be true we don't have the equipment to to make sure either way Mm. and i i I would love to send you some of the stuff that we've been working on to get your perspective on it Awesome. Because cool. that's the we're at this point right now where we show it to people and people, you know, lay people really enjoy it, but we haven't had a lot of super technical, you know, quantum engineers look at the interpretation to oh. see how it's working. So that'd be really I, useful for I us. would be very happy to have a look because you got me curious there. So yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, exactly. So let's I it, with your permission, let's table the conversation about what exactly is happening in the detector, can we? Yeah, yeah, of course. We have a whole other channel for that. I, so. uh, I joke that Shiloh is my like Tasmanian devil, where uh, if I ever have a physicist that I'm having an argument with, I just let Shiloh into the room and I walk away because he basically cleans up. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not trying to, I'm really just, yeah, just I'm just trying to make sense of things, that's all. Forgive me. <laughs> I, I think that it, I think that it's beautiful. I I just like I look. Mean, I, I think, think it, you. I think it really just can be settled by the, that. Look, like if we understand that a lot of, that these particles aren't material bodies, that they are the dynamical observations or predicted observations of some detectors and so forth, then we get a lot further down the road than if we reify them into these concrete actors that are capable of smashing and pulling on one another. And so, as long as we like can. Yes, sit there for a second. (laughs) Then a lot of these things begin to make more sense. So what I want to get to is I want to understand. I know, I know, I know. This is like anytime we have physics on the show, this is we have to get over. Quantum is cool. Sorry. Okay, I'll shut up. (laughs) We have to get over the the hump of the activation energy of like this conversation. And once we've passed it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. We have tunneled. So. Ex- tell us more about the way that you look at spin and biological systems. 
Okay. So, um, let me start with the chemistry, and I'll cross over to biology in a second. Okay. So there is, uh, again, no doubt, and that has existed, that has been known for decades, that there is a class of chemical reactions that depend on electron spins. So here's how this works. There's a chemical reaction happening, and at some point, this chemical reaction comes to a crossroads, and it effectively looks for the electron spin state of a particular electron. If this spin state is up, the chemical reaction continues through one branch. If that spin state of that particular electron is down, the chemical reaction continues through another branch. Importantly, the macroscopic final products of those two branches are different. So in test tube chemistry, there is no doubt that this finicky spin property of electrons uh, can, can shift big time uh, the, the, the outcome of chemical reactions. Like the, the spin quantumness is, might be brief, but the effects are felt at much longer time scales because everything happens downstream. It's like two roads that, that, that are, that are taken at different times depending of the spin. Now, if you, and this is, uh, this has been shown to, to work for like a series of proteins, biomolecules, uh, e even like materials that people produce in the lab, like in, in material science. Um, now, if at the point that this chemical reaction is at this crossroads, you put an external magnetic field, okay, this spin will talk or in other words, will sense this magnetic field, this external magnetic field, in a way that is indistinguishable from what happens, for example, in technological quantum sensors that sense magnetic fields. It's just that the, 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 the chemistry people do not call it quantum sensing, but that's exactly what happens in quantum sensing. This means that this uh, magnetic field is going to actually uh, alter the superposition states of uh, the electron that that matters, and will actually uh, change the probability of finding the electron up, and the chemical reaction continuing through this branch, or the electron down, and the chemical reaction continuing through another branch. So this uh, magnetic field will, via this spin knob, actually also alter the final products of this class of chemical reactions. Can can you tell me how how the spin changes a chemical reaction? Maybe uh, does it just mean that? Yeah, go ahead. Is this like chirality uh, of molecules? Chirality plays a role. It's not only in chiral molecules, but but there's like funky stuff that happens uh, with spins uh, when they go with electrons and electron spins when they go through chiral molecules. We can talk about that later. That that might be uh, involved, but what I'm uh, 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 trying to, to 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 explain to you here is more generic. It's just that there are things that happen macroscopically if spins are down or up. Uh, people don't usually know exactly what happens after those two different roads are taken. People think that it has to do with like conformational changes in the proteins that sustain this type of spin-dependent chemical reactions. And many times people don't really know exactly like the final products, how they are affected. All that people know is that the, 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 the distribution of products from those chemical reactions, they are affected by magnetic fields via this spin knob that I'm calling. Importantly, and that's a big point, for reasons that are well understood, and I can explain in a second, the magnetic fields that can actually alter the spins in those chemical reactions, they are relatively weak. So uh, if we put the, um, um, say, a, a vial of magnetosensitive proteins, of proteins that can sustain such spin-dependent chemical reactions inside a magnetic resonance imager, like with 3 Tesla, that big 3 Tesla magnetic field is not going to be able to influence the yield of this chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. There is not a linear, like the, the, the dependence on the strength of the effect is not linear. Actually it's, actually, it's not monotonic. It usually goes up and down for like a particular uh, magnetic field. 
Hmm. It's centered on, and for reasons that are well understood. In in short terms, um, what happens is that this spin is sensing not only this external magnetic field, but magnetic fields that uh, come from uh, nuclear spins nearby. And this is a process of, if you will, of interference between this um, internal magnetic field made by nuclear spins and this external magnetic field, so that when one overpowers the other by a lot, uh, th- th- there is no there is no effect. And if you put the proteins inside a three Tesla magnetic field, those tiny internal magnetic fields are, are no comparison. So there is there is no trade off between those two effects. That's the so zero order why weak magnetic fields matter. And by weak magnetic fields, I mean magnetic fields on the order of the Earth's, on the order of your cell phone. And again, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth is like orders of magnitude smaller than the magnetic field of your cell phone. So this comes from chemistry to biology because of birds. I'm going to tell you again, I don't care about birds at all. Uh, <laughs> But, but but they were important because they historically were what brought this whole conversation from chemistry to biology. And okay, I, I want to hear I want to hear about birds, but let me make yeah, sure that yeah, I understand yeah. what you've said so far. Yes. So you're essentially saying that the spin quality of one substrate change uh, changes whether it's going to interact with some other substrate, and and it seems like it's somehow affecting the structure of that that so, ultimate. Uh, product essentially but, somehow uh, yes and it's either uh, it's, functional or it's not basically it's it's not uh, yes th- that's all all fine um people if i talk to biologists and chemists uh people do not know how to predict whether like a protein will be able to sustain a spin dependent chemical reaction or or not uh it's not all proteins usually uh, spin-dependent chemical reactions are sustained in proteins that have a chromophore mm. and that are usually related, and I'm so happy to, to talk to you, in a sense, uh, related to a redox biology, uh, reactions that involve charge transfer, whatever charge is, <laughs> right? Uh, but um, those two things seem to be a commonality. Uh, proteins that can sustain spin-dependent chemical reaction usually uh, or the most studied of them have a chromophore, and they are involved in redox biology. Well, okay, that so makes, I mean, that makes so much sense, because if you look oh, at the me. structural yeah. organization of chromophores, or you look at the redox center of, let's say, a protein that's part of the electron transport chain, okay. they look like antennas. They like, started calling them antennas, I noticed on Wikipedia today, which is pretty cool. That's great. Because, I mean, like, you look at, like, the iron sulfur cluster at the heart of, I don't remember the names of these complexes oh. anymore. But yeah, like, in, in mitochondria and stuff, no. Like, yeah, exactly. Okay. And it's oh. basically, you have this crystalline iron atom it's an ion and then on all sides it's coordinated by sulfur molecules so it's basically held in place and you can imagine that it could go like this and that if it's moving in some concerted way by virtue of being held in place in this kind of movable sulfur matrix then all of a sudden it makes sense that it could induce some kind of wave-like change nearby in something and by by vibrating at the right frequency, it could then vibrate the the, the molecule that it comes in contact oh, with. Oh, oh my God! I, I, and there there's something that is related to that, uh, which is the fact that um, there's a lot of processes in biology. When you talk about vibration, here's what I associated with: there's a lot of processes in biology that are now known to be um, noise enhanced. They're noise assisted. Noise, when I mean noise, I mean, I mean phonons, like really uh, vibrations, not necessarily what you were referring to, to before. But there are many processes in biology that seem to harness like vi- vibration, like phonons, in order to happen and to happen better, right? So totally, what, what you're saying is... But I think totally it's not totally unrelated to, to the electrical phenomenon yeah. because yeah, yeah. ultimately, like, the, totally the vibration in these antennas is electrical right it's electromagnetic in terms like if you you can tune an antenna by its dimensions essentially but it still has to do oh, cool that, with that's a, a nice analogy that's a very nice analogy cool 
but oh it, my gosh, but, I'm having but so the much more that <laughs> yeah, awesome. But the the further you get down the road with making sense of what this means for the material, the atoms to have these electric waves in them, and you think about the surfaces of the atoms doing things, then the closer it gets to phonons, actually, at the end of the day, where you're actually talking about material displacements and things like that. I, I think that the it's more than an analogy, but that's probably beyond the scope of this conversation. Can, can, can I have can can I have a question? I'm I'm going to geek out. Uh, yeah, I have a question yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for the redox biology on the call. Okay, <laughs> biologist on the call. So. Um, there's a reason that I ask this, and I can explain later. Why is that so many cells that never see the light, cells in our body that never see the light, or even like or unicellular algae that are found in the very, very deep bottom of the sea that never see light, why is there, I mean, why many, many times it's common for them to, to have chromophores if they don't see light? Is it just that evolution didn't didn't take them out by chance or do you think they're being used for something those those chromophores inside cells that that are not because i, I have i have a hypothesis that i can tell you in a second but what do you think well i mean chromophores tend to be really resonant molecules yep. and so if the resonance is important for catalysis or for enzymatic reactions, or for tuning the conditions of the cell, then we, we were kind of talking about this earlier, where if you have a, uh, like, if, if we treat the chromophore as being only reactive to a certain frequency of light, that okay. might be missing that it's reacting in a different way to, let's say, infrared. Yeah, I was going to say all atoms are constantly generating light as well. It's it, There's never, even though it's not visible light, right? Well, that we actually had somebody on the show who was, who was using these like photo, photo detector cells. And in okay. a dark room, you can put a photo detector on somebody's body and, and the yeah. body is, is releasing light. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. It, exactly. the light might actually be functional on, on a Th biological level. That is exactly level. My, my, my hypothesis. Because, yes, there are many chemical processes inside cells that emit light as a byproduct, right? And my hypothesis is that, again, just a hypothesis, not I would love to do experiments to, to prove or, or disprove that. But my hypothesis is that those chromophores are maybe being used somehow by those uh, they're being activated somehow by absorption of those photons that uh, that, that are produced by chemical reactions and and again those those chromophores are optimized to absorb very low levels of light so i am super interested in 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 this too like why is it that that we keep chromophores and if those chromophores can indeed be activated internally somehow, right? Uh, I think that there's a chance that the type of spin-related, spin-dependent chemical reaction that I study, there is a possibility that it's way, way more widespread than thought because those processes usually require the absorption of light. This is so, so, so cool. Isn't I, this cool? I, I just... It's like this is the gap in this is the this is the gap at the end of my thesis where I wrote it on a molecular level. I was studying oh. these redox sensitive molecules called phenazines. Okay. And oh, so pseudomon no. pseudomonas originosa. Yeah, phenazines. So okay. uh, pseudomonas originosa releases all of these really vibrant compounds that change their color on the basis of their redox state. And so you can actually track chem the, the, the redox state of your culture on the basis of its color. I, I'm going to geek out here, but by how much is the change? Is like change from red to green or is it very close in the spectrum? It changes It changes from yellow. It, it can huge, change yeah. from yellow to blue, from oh red to yellow, like massive. And there are these little like heterocyclic compounds that, that are nitrogenated rings. And they're they're produced endogenously in their quorum sensing molecules too. So like the the cultures will produce them in large quantities when they get to a certain yeah, density. So cool. And so, but it was always the the massive question at the heart of all of this was why do these cells produce these compounds? Because they're metabolically expensive. Like they're hard to produce. And you would think that if you could do it in some other way, that you would do it. But the cool thing is, is that they 
diffuse out of the cell. And then when it's in the biofilm, they're being passed through the biofilm and reaching other cells and in affecting their gene expression and so the community oh is talking to itself on the basis of these electrically sensitive molecules that are being so passed cool. along i know this is so cool do, do you know the dude uh, I mean, he's very nice from ucsd that is uh working on this like uh communication between cultures of bacteria via electro impulses no but that sounds oh totally my up my God. what yeah. was his name oh. I, I don't know. He's super, it's okay, it's super okay. cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you this 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 info. Oh my god, I'm I'm totally geeked out. Okay, awesome. I'm uh, I'll, 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 I'll I'll search you. <laughs> I'll search our cheeses now. You got me interested. Cool. Okay. I mean, another thing. This is a little out of left field, but I'm curious if you have thoughts on it. The there appear to be other bio antennas inside of the cells. The one that sticks out to me the most is heme, actually, which looks a lot like chlorophyll which is really, really quite interesting because obviously we pin the entire energetic funnel for plants on chlorophyll, and yet we're not really thinking too much about the electromagnetic uh, role of heme in the body as well. Yeah, because heme is kind of viewed as being like, well, it absorbs oxygen at high partial pressures and releases it at low partial pressures at the cell, and so it's this... Which, which it does. It does. But, but like, what else is going on? It's literally just viewed as an oxygen shuttle, but it it, it has the same sort of antenna-like structure that an iron sulfur cluster does. So, so, so he, here's what I know about I, I don't know a lot. I, 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 can, I can make hypotheses. I know a little bit about chlorophyll. So um, from the point of view of uh, spin, I'm told by uh, spin chemists that uh, heme is a, not a very good place for for electron spins to, to, to survive for a very long time in a superposition, exactly because I think uh, of, of the iron and the iron... Mm, seems to i don't fully understand what what's going on so but the iron seems to bring those spins to to like classicality very fast so from the point of view of spins i do not have anything to say about him however and that ties up with with chlorophyll um again i'm not sure if it's called chlorophyll but with this whole photosynthesis stuff right so in photosynthesis and again photosynthesis is way better than any solar cell made by humankind and the principle of photosynthesis in solar cells is you grab you absorb the energy from a photon and then you you have to dump this energy somewhere else uh, i don't know if it's the same with him but uh, you, you tell me if that's that's like this or not so uh the newer uh, consensus on what's going on in like photosynthesis is that um, this transport from absorption of photon to energy dumping of this photon into into the the, the whatever wherever they go is uh, assisted by noise is assisted by phonons. Okay, that uh, phonons like in the environment might actually be helping this transport of energy it's like one instance where noise can actually happen i just wonder now again totally out of the blue just hypothesis if you say that that there, there's something that looks similar in him maybe there, there's stuff that is also noise assisted in in those compounds or, or not it's like there's not enough energy for it to be transferred by it or to be transferred fast enough or something like that without <laughs> taking some energy from the environment Taking and giving, that's the cool part. So uh, the, the, the tiny energies of the... F so in quantum mechanics, energy levels are quantized. That is, you can have this energy or this energy or this energy and nothing in between. So maybe uh, the, 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 the thing that is carrying the, the energy of the photon has one energy and it needs to go, go either up or down, but it doesn't have the full energy so that it either absorbs a photon and go up or it sends off a phonon and goes down. It goes both ways. And there are actually very beautiful uh, quantum experiments, actually quantum computing experiments that simulate in a very rudimentary way uh, this type of phenomena and show that actually if you add noise, you can 
improve like uh, information transfer rates, which is exactly what's what's going on here. Well, if you okay, so if you imagine a uh, an atomic lattice that doesn't have any noise in it as being rigid. Yep. Like if you almost think of it as like a, a non-Newtonian fluid where if you hit it really hard, it's stiff. But if it's okay. already moving, it's easier for something to happen inside uh, of it. Cool. C- cool. And I don't I don't know. I like that. I case. like how you think about visualizations. Cool. There's uh there's something else that we came across on the podcast was we had this guy who was I mean, he was he was like an ancient archaeology guy. But one of the things that he pointed us to was this plant researcher who dis- who found that some of the pyramids in uh, Tikal and these areas in Belize- in the Yucatan had uh, electrical anomalies at their tops. And he showed that if you took seeds prior to germination and took them to the top of the pyramid, they would germinate better when oh, you took so them cool. down. Yeah, yeah, no, no. There's So uh, I, I don't know about electric fields, but for magnetic magnetic fields there's a lot of data that weak magnetic fields mess up big time with like seed germination with like embryogenesis uh again i I, and i totally understand and i i totally buy that there are places on earth that for one reason or the other have like anomalies that that people see things and let me tell you about like magnetic field effects for for like embryogenesis in general it comes with the story. It, it's a cool story. I, 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 are we back to the birds? We're back to the birds? No, 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 no. no, no. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> birds are so still We'll bad. get to the birds. We got to make it to the birds eventually. It's so cool. We're going in so many different ways. So um, there's a colleague of mine, a physicist called Peter Fierlinger. What he does for a living is he builds very good uh, magnetic enclosures that shield external magnetic fields. That's what he does for a living. He, he's in uh, the TU Munich, the Technical University of Munich. And what happens is that what what he usually does it for is he builds those very good hypomagnetic chambers and then he puts like cold atoms, quantum experiments inside that are very sensitive to external magnetic fields. So just for you to have an idea of how good his chambers are, magnetic field of your cell phone, one millitesla, Magnetic field of Earth, 50 microtesla. The noise level DC of his chambers, one nanotesla. So that's crazy. So he started hearing about like, oh, crazy magnetic field effects in biology. So here's what he did. Uh, he's a physicist, so he didn't have authorization to, to work with bio animals or, or, or stuff. So bio stuff. Uh, he only could work for stuff for two days. Here's what he did. Um, he grew tadpoles, like new batches of tadpoles uh, inside those uh, hypomagnetic field chambers under two conditions. And this experiment has now been reproduced in two other labs. It, very cool stuff. In one batch of tadpoles, on top of the nanotesla residual field, they applied a, ma- a tiny magnetic field on the order of the Earth, which is about 50 microtesla. Tiny. Okay, but after two days, the tadpoles were like macroscopically okay. For the tadpoles that were grown only under the nanotesla field, about 40% of the embryos after two days were not viable. They were deformed. I've seen pictures. It's like crazy, like things that there are where they shouldn't be. So, because the magnitude of the fields are so small, and that's why birds are extraordinary, because they can sense the magnetic fields of the Earth, right? And and let me recap of what I just told you. You didn't need to apply a magnetic field. You just took out the tiny magnetic field of the Earth, and you crashed with the physiology of tadpoles after two days. Because the field strengths are so small, if it were like a magnetic a tiny magnet present in 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 those uh, in those tadpoles, right? That would be responding to the absence of the field somehow. The those magnet magnetic materials, those magnetite things, would have to be huge because only a huge magnet would re- respond to such small changes of field. Since those have never been observed and they would be huge in tadpoles, everyone's best. Guess is that this is a spin dependent chemical reaction that is messing up somehow with embryogenesis. 
uh, other experiments done also under hypomagnetic field conditions show that um, the absence, taking out the magnetic field of the Earth, changes like epigenetic markers such as methylation and things like this. So this this opens up like a whole new Pandora box, right? That that go from like space exploration. If you want to colonize Mars, what's the magnetic field on Mars? And spoiler alert, it's way smaller than the magnetic field of the Earth. So can you colonize Mars? Can you grow lettuce in Mars? What do you need to do space farming? It's people only care about microgravity, cosmic rays. People need to start caring about magnetic fields. Right? So I would also I would really also crazy. want to know what happens if you generate if you grow the tadpoles and put a cell phone inside of this thing. There have been experiments uh, with uh, ion channels. You can change the functioning of ion channels by placing a cell phone close to a culture. Yikes. I th- it's like, that's both so exciting and so terrifying. Y- yes, I know. So can, can I talk about birds? Because I'm, I'm getting yes. to this point where yes. I really need to tell about all the evidence that is out there. Right. So yes. birds, again, I don't care about birds. It's way more <laughs> widespread than birds. So, but birds. Uh, birds, um, it's been known again for like 70 years that when they migrate, they use at least the partial cue, the magnetic field of the Earth, which again, is tiny. Right. How might they be doing this? In the end of the 70s, a brave theoretical biophysicist who was hailed as, as crazy at the time made the outrageous at that point hypothesis. Here's what he hypothesized. Well, were this type of spin-dependent chemical reaction happening inside birds under physiological conditions, well, maybe birds could sense or respond to magnetic fields because they would be able to sense different physiological concentrations of products coming from these spin-dependent chemical reactions. Absurd hypothesis, because in order for that to work, spin superpositions would be needed to be maintained and utilized by molecules inside a cell. And the wet, warm environment of a cell uh, actually brings things to, to, to classicality uh, way faster than, than than you would have, say, in a quantum computer that is at like 4 Kelvin. Right? So um, to this day, even though um, in test tube solutions at room temperature, there is no doubt that quantum stuff like superpositions are happening and are having consequences within this test tube. To this date, there is no ambiguous confirmation or refutal that superpositions can be maintained inside or let alone utilized in single cells. But let me tell you what there is. Okay? There is a lot of correlative data spanning more than 40 years, almost 50 years, that things such as whole birds, plates of cells, planaria, again, Pick, pick your organism. I can send you tables like ion channels. There's evidence that those things respond to magnetic fields in a way that is consistent with what would be expected if those behaviors were driven by independent chemical reactions under the hood. Okay. There's a lot of evidence that phenomena such as, I, I have a, a little list here because people need to, to, to understand how powerful this is, evidence for that. Again, the evidence is correlative. There is, I mean, needless to say, I, I'm going to, the, the punchline here is that we are trying to build the experiments to unambiguously prove or refute that this is indeed quantum. But there is a lot of beautiful, I mean, the data is not super like, systematic or anything, but people who say that electromagnetics in biology is not a thing, they're just out of date. It cannot be that a lot of people are this wrong. Okay. So th- things um, that, that have been shown to depend on magnetic fields in a way consistent with spin-dependent chemical reactions uh, range from wound healing to DNA repair yields to cellular respiration rates, cellular glycolysis rates, Metabolism working inside mitochondria. Importantly, the up and down regulation of cellular proliferation for cancer, for example, right, or for biomanufacturing. 
regulation of production of ROS, stem cell regeneration, stem cell like differentiation, ion channel, cellular migration, like a cytoskeleton configuration, of oxidative phosphorylation. If one can show that oxidative phosphorylation can be controlled by magnetic fields in a deterministic way, that's huge. Methylation rate. So there's a lot of things that I mean from like a from like a science fiction standpoint, we've all seen the movies where like the hero in the space movie goes into this chamber and it, it analyzes his health and then applies some, you know, electromagnetic field and repairs his body and I know this is like really well, far out, but it seems reasonable in some sense yes, as well. It's the Star Trek tricorder, right? So here's a point that I would like to make, which is important. The technology to apply the weak magnetic field strengths and frequencies that one would need is already there. You don't need yeah. big machines. You don't need like anything else. You don't need a big chamber. You don't need a big magnet. Your cell phone could do this in principle. That's so cool. That's so cool. But what's missing is a deterministic understanding of which magnetic fields influence, like which magnetic field frequencies and intensity influence which chemical reactions. So, for example, there is this company now valued at $9 billion called Novacure that they produce a device called Optune that treat a glioblastoma, which is a serious type of brain cancer, using what they call two more treating fields. So basically, if you go into their in, into their like uh, uh, documents, um, those are weak AC electric fields. They call it AC electric fields, which are again uh, indistinguishable from from a magnetic field, right? And if you go to the frequencies they utilize and the intensities that they utilize, that is consistent with what would be expected if the driving mechanism for the disruption of the the tumor growth was driven by a spin dependent chemical reaction except that if you if you look at like people doing electromagnetic treatments people using this device nowhere is there a mechanistic understanding of mm. what's going on in order to do this you know like because if you don't have a way of deterministically finding this code book, well, this magnetic field does this, you're left to look for a needle in a haystack because you can change magnetic field frequency, intensities, and that's what people have been doing over the literature for the past like 40 years, right? They say, well, a three millitesla, like three times your mobile phone at this frequency does this. And then the other thing, the other people go and say, well, a DC magnetic field at this frequency does that. And there's no direct comparison. And it's all, all like, heuristic mm -hmm. we need a mechanistic understanding and my big big uh, idea here is to bring techniques borrowed from quantum instrumentation to study and control those spin degrees of freedom in biology as if they were electron spin say in a material with those like big instruments that we're building we can have hope to deterministically find like the the underlying the, the underlying like uh, ways that the spin is responding to magnetic fields. For the experts, just a quick parenthesis, this means like understanding the spin Hamiltonian. If we understand the spin Hamiltonian, we know exactly how each spin is tweaked in each way. And then after you build those experiments, you don't need super technology. You only need your cell phone. You don't need the nap where you can go and say, well, today I need help with wound healing. And then you click there and it produces the exact magnetic field intensity and frequency that you need. And then you do this. It kind of reminds me of the early days of cancer therapy when you would apply these like really blunt poisons to the body and you, you do, maybe you kill off some tumor cells, but you also mess everything else up. And then obviously we're moving into these targeted therapies different types of targeted yeah. therapies and that seems to be definitely the future of a lot of those um at least i don't know what you want to call it but the just more destructive therapies and i, I think that you can imagine yeah. something similar here where the just yeah. the information landscape is too vague right now to really target what what's going on but and it's really like electromagnetics in biology as treatments right it's non-invasive uh it's non-chemical right it's just like tweaking new degrees of freedom that we have been neglecting for so long right it, yeah. it's like it's a good thing and a bad thing like if 
biology is really using quantum mechanics to function. Our understanding of biology is radically flawed, but the opportunity is that we have the possibility of like a, an extra knob, you know, of of tweaking those degrees of freedom that were not known towards, for instance, therapeutics. It seems like we might also be making a headache for ourselves in terms of policing all of the electromagnetic pollution that we have going on, if if it's fair to call it pollution. Um, you know, you're always told, like, your 5G device poses no risk to you, blah, blah, blah. And um, I don't know. I've I've tried to dig into those topics before. I've tried to read the literature. It's very difficult to parse. There's some studies that show that there's problems. There's some that... So there's yeah. no problems. And it just I, seems I, like it's just a, kind of an info hazard, really. Yeah, and and I think so. It, it, so here's what I would say: don't don't panic for for the time being. So because uh, those studies are for the time being inconclusive, it may be that only in 50 years, like when people started to smoke, right? Only in 50 years we will know mm. if that's a problem or not. But uh, chemical reactions that depend on spin, they only depend on very particular magnetic field intensities and frequencies. So it would really be bad luck if your cell phone manufacturer got exactly the frequency and intensity right, either to to mess up with your physiology or to improve it, right? Actually, you can also use, in principle, magnetic fields to to improve your, your overall health. Yeah, maybe so, it's just a wash, right? Maybe it's maybe you're helping yourself in some ways and hurting yourself, and at the end of the day, yeah, it's exactly. just difficult to separate it out. This makes me think of, uh, do you know Jackie Barton? Of course, yes. yes. Yeah, so Jackie... Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yes, yes, I know. Well, I mean, just yeah. What do you? What do you? Would do? Do you work with her, or you're just you're no, familiar? No, no, no. But but she she she. Uh, oh, you, you might know her because she's all 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 um about like uh electron transport and DNA and stuff. She showed that the yield of DNA repair in um in a type of bacteria uh is magnetic field dependent in a way consistent with this type of chemical reaction. I, exactly. And so there's there's all these tantalizing clues from all these different directions that people have yes. been pointing to it from from different vantage points. Yes. And it seems like what you're doing is you're really trying to say, OK, we need to codify this into a field because yes. when it's a field, we have a place yes. where we can gather and we can discuss this. And yes. that's so important. Like I'm reading this book right now called Deep Life. And uh, it's about Note the down. Yeah, <laughs> it's I'm about getting the, a lot of stuff. Yeah, that I'm noting down from it. Thank you. Okay, it's such a good book. It's about the discovery of subterranean microbes in these deep mines. Those are cool. Yeah, and so because we're we're working on a book right now, and I'm writing a chapter on the origin of life, and I have this kind of harebrained theory about where it might be happening or how it happened, and so I've been reading this book because this guy basically went on this mission to these mines in South Africa to find what was happening. And he was a geologist to begin with, and he transitioned into microbiology because he was so interested in this project. And he's describing how he's bringing people together, where he is organizing projects. And on the basis of organizing this project, he's getting all this funding to bring people together that are focused oh, cool. on the same thing. And there's this immediate acceleration of progress because you have all of these minds that come together. And instead of him, you know, traipsing around a mine by himself, he's bringing together people that have a different set of 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 expertises and capabilities to interrogate the question and so the speed at which they're discovering things accelerates wildly whereas before they were kind of you know one person in one university one person in another university he's like no we're going to work on this project together and they do incredible things and i'm oh, so cool. depressed that he died oh he like he was he was only like sixty. Because you wanted to talk to him. I really really yeah, wanted to that talk to me him. all the time. It's so terrible. Must, yeah. yeah. But I just like go looking for. I find somebody's work, and then I'm like, oh man, we got to get this person on the podcast, and then I'm like, oh, they're not here yeah, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's just it's so vital for for progress to have a community of people that are focused on the question. Because if you're working yes. by yourself, I'm sure that you can yes. make progress. But it's yes. it's very different than when you have people that are all yes. trying to work it out. It's absolutely important, and uh, one of the other hats that I wear has to do with trying to make quantum biology a legitimate field, right? So, well, this is partially for selfish reasons, because right now it's hard to get funding for that. Like, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a program officer from NIH told me, like, Clarice, don't bother applying 
NIH is not ready for, for quantum biology. And, uh, and there is a hype around like interdisciplinary science, but it's very hard to get funding for interdisciplinary science. People say, hey, interdisciplinarity. But for example, at NSF, the National Science Foundation, sometimes, I know it's not always, but sometimes if you uh, put a, uh, if you place a interdisciplinary proposal, it has to be approved into two different panels. So a small probability P squared that it gets approved. So interdisciplinary science is different, is difficult. Quantum biology has had so much baggage associated with it. The quantum community, the mainstream quantum community, I'm a physicist by training, and the physicists are the worst. They sometimes don't want to, to engage with you. Like, mm. I mean, there are technological quantum sensors, for example, that work at room temperature, again, in a way very similar to those spin-dependent chemical reactions, but they just, they, they tell you like, no, I mean, you're crazy. Biology does not depend on quantumness. And then you go talk to the biologists and the biologist is like, well, we've been doing things chem chemically for like forever. Why do we need electromagnetics or, or quantum? So it's been very hard. It's been a very hard uh, barrier to make this field uh, more visible, making this field more reputable so that I can get grants, so that I can get exciting top students for this field and so that there are more younger people in this field. Right now, the landscape of quantum biology is very sad because people pivot to working on quantum biology in the second half, last third of their career, when they have a source of funding like coming, that is, that they know where, where it's from. And that's, that's the death of a field, right? You need people with new ideas, new techniques. You need to be encouraging young blood to join this feud. I just wanted to, to say to say something which I'm very happy about. Uh, I have a uh, opinion piece that has just been published in the American Physical Society uh, online magazine called It's Time to Take Quantum Biology Research Seriously. And I'm extremely proud because this is the first time that I think APS, the American Physical Society, recognizes this field. So I think it's an important step. And again, it's uh, it's been very hard to share the message with people, like preach a little bit that there are things that need to be explained that that are real, right? And and yeah, I mean, I think that I think it's a really strong selling point where you're like, look, we already have the technology and the power necessarily to actualize these changes in biology. It's just a matter of refining the knowledge base. And you know, I I wanted to mention too that like a huge long term goal for our project. I mean, obviously, we're doing this podcast mostly right now. And Nastia mentioned we're, we're writing a book too, but we have our we're working on a bunch of media. But ultimately, we hope to be able to found a nonprofit where we can give grants to projects that don't fit into those incremental academic uh, purposes, you know, yeah. that most people would look to the NIH or um, yeah. something like that that's really focused on some safe, you know, index funds version of of progress essentially and so i think that's really important and I, and I think there are a number of people like us who are starting to work towards setting up those kinds of external institutions yeah. because i think the academy yeah. has a lot of value in what it does but it's not really cut out for um what's what's the word um dis innovation yeah disruptive innovation things that are actually going to change what it does um seem to be favored against systematically which is because you know, it's not because it's like a big evil monster. It's just that it doesn't do that, essentially. So I absolutely agree with that. So, for example, there are three Nobel Prizes in physics uh, whom I've seen. And I, I have those interviews because I, I, I saved it. Uh, that say that given current governmental science funding landscape, given the current landscape of science funding from the government, they wouldn't have been able to to do the work that, that gave them the Nobel Prize. Mm. Um, I also think that private science institutes are here to stay and like decide uh, things. Um, and I think that it might be 
I don't think it might be a new thing. Let me just share with you some examples that I've been thinking about, right? I think that sometimes innovation starts in the private sector and then gets absorbed and funded by the government. So we can start as early as the, the Renaissance, that where the, the Medici is funded all the art, like the, the big, all, all the Ninja Turtles, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Going to to like the British aristocracy that self funded themselves to like uh, I don't know if you know that but um, the first particle accelerator was privately funded by a guy who amassed a big fortune uh, during the the twenty nine um, stock exchange crash. Mm. He actually got a lot of money and he, a little bit out of guilt. He he. Uh, he funded like basic scientists who wanted to, to explore particle physics experimentally in a way that wasn't there before. Uh, Bell Labs uh, from from Bell phone company, right? They came up with so much innovation in such a short amount of time that I've never seen before. SpaceX, they needed like mm. Elon Musk needed to be here to 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 do better than NASA to make a reusable aircraft and finally uh, i I'm, I'm hoping that i'm pronouncing her name correctly kathleen Kuriko. Kuriko? so uh, i don't know if you know her she was um really the driving force behind the the rna vaccine she had been working on rna stuff for vaccines since the 90s and she's had like a ostracized academic career it's such a pity so she recounts her struggles like nobody really understands what she wants to do. She only to today she only has like an adjunct position. And then like using her technology, RNA vaccines were used for COVID. So if you go to, to like her web page in Wikipedia, it's so sad because for all her career, like before 2020, she had like two very minor prizes or any recognition, local, whatever. And now, since 2020, she has more like than 80 prizes. It, mm. It's crazy. Imagine like how much a person. But like in in, in one sense, it it probably helped her to be in that uh, less visible position. I think maybe she was able to play with her own ideas a little more. And because if you're inside of if you're at the head of some super lab and you've got all these people working under you, you're probably going to be more conservative in the way that you approach something. Uh, I think there, there's a, a, a mid-ground between those two things because if you yeah, are sure. working alone without funding, right, without help, without political push, which is what I'm lacking right now. So in quantum biology, there is no senior figure to, to bring me up, to, to nominate me for, for stuff or to increase my, my ability to get grants. That's a very precarious place to do your science. Yeah. So, what is your what is your do you have a strategy going forward for how to to stabilize yourself and the field? Well, I can this talking to you and talking to people who want to hear about quantum biology is part of this strategy. Awareness is the first step towards people noticing it, uh, understanding that this is not woo woo science, right? And again, I keep talking. Um, Again, it's a time investment. It, uh, I keep talking to, to program officers. I keep talking to my colleagues. And again, sometimes I get people saying like, well, it's too controversial that electromagnetics do anything in biology. And then I'm like, what can I tell you? I mean, here's the evidence. Here are those tables of data over 40 years that people have seen at some point. You either believe or you don't believe. So it's 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 a slow process on how to change people's minds and how to change. But but it's been hard to sustain a productive group under this these circumstances. Yes. So your work on the on in a very in my currently superficial understanding of it seems like it overlaps a lot with Michael Levin's work. I was going to say yes. the same thing. <laughs> yes. 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 So, I actually think. Oh, go, go for it. Go for it. No, no, no. Go ahead, please. I actually think that some of the phenomena that he sees uh, are driven by spin-dependent chemical reactions. For example, when he applies uh, weak alternating electric fields, 
uh, I think that a lot of those things are consistent. And he knows that. I know him and he knows that. He, he's a super nice guy he, who's also like at the forefront of a bunch of stuff. Uh, I think a lot of the things that he sees, particularly related to regeneration, to ion channel functioning, I think those are consistent with uh, magnetic fields being the, the, the force and spin-dependent chemical reactions being the force. When we've talked to him on the show, he's he's expressed this... He's expressed kind of a gentle bewilderment at the fact that he tries to talk to people about what he thinks is actually happening and how they're much less interested in that than technological applications. And he's we've talked to him twice now, a year apart, and his his mode of of work has seemed to shift pretty significantly towards my job is to create a technology that is undeniable, undeniable. <laughs> yeah. where where by the time that i have something that works the philosophy that has gone into making it will be my legacy and no one cares about it because when i start talking about it at conferences people are like michael stop doing that but that is what allows me to actually do the work. And he has this really fantastic perspective on it where he's like, look, yeah. there are many theories in biology and many people yeah. have different perspectives on how biology works. And the real test is what it lets you do. Yeah. And so yeah. if you can do something on the basis of your theory that no one else has been able to achieve, yeah. that's, the, that's the foundational proof. And so I wonder if... In addition to the research of mechanism, if in the back of your mind you're like, man, it would be cool to build something. Oh, no, we are already building stuff, right? Uh, we have in our lab more correlative data that magnetic fields uh, are doing stuff in, in biology, right? So e even if I didn't believe any of what's published before, I trust my people 200%. So we see things like with five times the magnetic field of your cell phone, we see actin changes, microtubule polymerization changes, uh, ROS production changing, nuclear and mitochondrial morphology changes. So we do those things too. Um, and we're starting to sell that at, as like an endogenous, non-invasive, cheap, portable, remotely actuated electromagnetic treatment that is accessed by, by anyone with a cell phone. Th this is already a reality. We can keep on taking this type of data. And I don't think the needle will move, especially not in, uh, in quantum biology, before we have an unambiguous uh, understanding of the extent to which those things are real, uh, are really quantum in nature, right? Right now, we have an ambiguous data in test tube and correlative data in 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 like big organisms we need to be able to show that those things are linked i think that doing this that requires a lot of time a lot of instrumentation moves the needle for people to to pay attention to say no those things are quantum that's exactly what you're doing and i think that we can keep on doing the, those experiments like those low-tech experiments forever and th those experiments actually help us because we know where to start with magnetic fields when we go to the big experiments. But I think that the efforts are going to be moot if we cannot advance, move the needle by actually getting the deterministic code book on which, mag like the, the, the underlying Hamiltonian, the underlying phys spin physics that's going on. Because otherwise, people are going to be searching for electromagnetic field effects in biology as they have been for 40 years, which is like a huge non-systematic exploration of the phase space. That is huge. Biology seems to respond from magnetic fields from DC to like gigahertz. So how do you pick an intensity? How do you pick you know a uh, uh, frequency and in order to do this the 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 the, the, the big stuff here the long-term stuff is this mapping that needs like those more sophisticated things but again my, my point is that we can already actuate right i mean if by chance we find a magic magnetic field like Optune found for a particular kind of cancer. Let's spin that off, even without mechanism, right? But in the long term, it makes more sense.
to do this deterministically in a way that that we we have we can predict what's going to happen and not just search back and forth. This is so amazing and it's so cool that you've gotten the American Physical Society to pay attention and that you're spearheading it even in the face of not having a structure that you're working inside of necessarily and I just I'm so, so excited to see where it goes. And, and I love that this highlights an interesting piece of the technology science misunderstanding too, because like, it is absolutely possible to make electronic devices without the faintest idea of what electricity is. But will you really be able to make it into the next level if you yeah. don't understand it, right? It's like, I think that scientists often get comfortable with the, the broad scale understanding because it allows them to do so much but how much more could they do if they had that mechanistic understanding is the real question at the end of the day and i think that biomedicine in general in particular is the place where you really see like like anastasia came up with this awesome thought experiment she was like you know if we had just continued treating uh genetics as these heritable fields that passed from one organism to the next. And we never had a material understanding of DNA and the molecular crystal, you know, as it was originally um, called. I think it was Schrodinger, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, if, we only, if we never had that, you know, we could probably get pretty far. We could probably do statistical modeling and understand heredity, yeah. but would we be able to manipulate things like CRISPR-Cas? Exactly, Cas, exactly, right? exactly. And it's like, exactly. so for those quantum leaps in technology, I think you really do have to understand yes. the science of it. And, and I think here. that that kind of goes a little bit yeah. under the radar for, for most, at least young scientists who are coming up. Or, yeah, you know, and, and for funding agencies who, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's an totalitarian choice, right? People want to fund, or, or like most VCs, right? They all want things that happen fast and that bring a lot of money fast, a lot of results fast. So this is why science funding is reaching like there's a paper recently that says that innovation in science has been declining. Did you see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We talk about that a bunch. I mean, I wonder if you just, you might be already doing this, but I wonder if in your proposals and like, I'm just imagining if you were giving a TED talk or something, if you just led with this vision of what the future of medicine looked like and how non invasive and cheap and uh, reliance upon existing energy structures and technology. Like, if you could paint that picture in a sentence or two or a paragraph before you launch into it, I feel like that is what's missing. When I go to the quantum biology Wikipedia page and I start reading, I'm kind of like, what is the point no, here, no, no. you know? The point. No, no, no. And you, you uh, actually, you have that in both the pieces that you sent us because you mentioned the Star Trek tricorder. Yeah. And so it's it's there, but I, I always, I'm always trying to think in terms of, you know... W People are so emotional and we need, we need the vision of the yeah. future to, yeah. to latch onto. And I think that the, yeah. the vision of the world that you are working on is, is one that takes our technology and instead of letting it be a tool of destabilization and all these negative things that we deal with right now, it's basically yeah. saying that, hey, we have these devices and these devices could be the best thing mm. that ever happened to us yeah. instead of the worst thing. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. that's at I, I like how, how you phrase it. Can, can I can I steal that from you? Please. Yeah, please, yeah, we please, love please, it when please. we love it when people <laughs> steal it. We, we our favorite moment on the show is when somebody uh, who's working on a book or something is like, I'm gonna can I use that idea? We're like, Yes, yes, <laughs> please, that's why we're here. <laughs> cool. Cool. But um I don't know, it's it's this is all just Really, really exciting. I, I'm glad. I feel like I have a much better sense of the purpose of this work than when I first started reading about it. And cool. I, I'm really uh, excited for what comes. And I, and I hope that you can recruit more support in the near future. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Well, th thanks for giving me a platform, right? And, and if you're curious about quantum biology, there's a very good book um, written uh, almost 10 years ago by John John McFadden and Jim Maukalili from the University of Surrey in the UK called Life on the Edge. Uh, which details many other flavors of quantum bio. Well, we talked about some, right? We talked about spin, we talked about enzymes, uh, which has to do with tunneling. We talked about noise-assisted processes like photosynthesis. So if you want a broader overview, Life on the Edge is... I'm not being paid to promote their book, <laughs> but it's, it, it's a very good book. It's a fun read. 
Excellent. Cool. Thank you so much. And hopefully we can catch up catch up down the line a little bit and see how things are developing. It would be really it would be really great to develop a a, a deeper relationship. Cool. Thank you. And I would be really happy to see your animations because I, I think those are great ideas and I'm, I'm, you got me curious now. So please, if you can share that, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. give you my comments. Excellent. Right, yeah. That'd be great. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It was Thank you both. It was wonderful. Thank you for giving me space here. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. We'll Bye. see you soon. Bye.